I'm often asked uh, how I've been able to sustain a viable massage therapy practice for 42 years now, and my answer is that I am still curious. Wow, that's I'm yes. curious why someone's shoulder hurts. I'm curious why a person's knee seems to ache only on one side. I'm, I'm very curious about these things. So every day is an exciting day. Welcome, guys, to the Integrate Yourself podcast with uh, Allison Pillow and Maya Gottlieb. Today, we have a, an especially great guest. His 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 knowledge, his background, everything that you ever uh, want to know about him is incredible. Um, I had the pleasure to meet him in a workshop in Atlanta. He came from Texas over to see us at the Georgia Massage School. His name is Benny Vaughn. The Massage Magazine actually... Um, gave him and recognized him as the 50th most influential professionals of hands-on soft tissue therapy in the world over the past hundred years. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Um, So just to say an understatement about what his credibility and his knowledge base, um, he uh, graduated from the University of Florida College of Health Human Performance with a degree in health and education and a specialist in certification in health promotion and wellness. He is a certified athletic trainer, a certified strength and conditioning specialist, and a board certified therapeutic massage and body worker practitioner. Out of the 42 years of massage therapy experiencing, treating athletes, fitness enthusiasts, and active adults, he's known internationally as an expert in assessment, treatment, care of athletic related soft tissue dysfunction using manual Technique. He has been a lecturer for professional wellness and therapy conferences all over the United States, Australia, Ireland, Japan, Spain, and Russia. His service to the Olympics has been amazing. He was also the program manager for the athletic medical services and member of the sports medicine staff for the USA track and field. His current operations uh, in athletic therapy center in Fort Worth, Texas, and he also teaches continuing education. You can uh, find him at www.bennyvonworkshops.com. And that led me back to how I met Benny Vaughn. <laughs> Benny Vaughn was an incredible teacher for me in terms of um, what I learned in a short time in November. He actually took, t- took the class in a well-rounded understanding of how to help people. And one of the things I took away from that workshop was I can always say to somebody, I can help you with that. The importance of touch, but why certain modalities work for certain people and why it kind of gives everyone um, an understanding that it's it's preventative medicine and it keeps helping people find ways to um, be their own authority and help themselves. So with all that introduction, I'd like to invite <laughs> Benny Vaughn. Tell us a little bit about yourself. What gave you the passion and the inspiration to be a massage therapist? Okay, well, well, thank you very much for that uh, very kind and uh, generous introduction. And uh, as I listened to you uh, introduce me, it made me realize that I've been doing massage for a very long time. Uh, 42 years now, and I still go to my office and see, on average, seven clients a day. And I schedule uh, my day in 90-minute blocks. And there are some days where uh, I will see eight clients because I leave uh, front end and back end for uh, emergencies or situations where uh, seeing the person sooner rather than later is the most prudent way to a solution to reduce or resolve pain or any of the challenges they may be having. 42 years I've been doing massage therapy and the reason that I do massage therapy is when I got involved in massage therapy in 1974 it was very apparent to me early on that touch was a very powerful vehicle and that touch was a very powerful vehicle to help people make change 
to make change away from pain, to make change towards better relationship with gravity and movement, and a powerful vehicle to send a message of care and compassion. So that interested me quite a bit. And it interested me from a athletic performance standpoint, but it also gave me great curiosity about its role in human performance in daily life, just living life and what we can do as human beings to live life fully. When I was in college, my degree is in uh, health education from the University of Florida, and I graduated from the College of Health and Human Performance. And one of the classes I had uh, was in psychology. I think we're all required to take psychology courses your first two years of college. And I just remember uh, studies that were done with uh, rhesus monkeys on touch deprivation. And the difference in the development of these animals where they had touch from the parent and those who had less touch from the parent. And the growth rate was affected. The intelligence of the animal was affected. And the general demeanor of the animal was affected. Uh, Fast forward to the Touch Research Institute at the University of Miami Medical School and the research work that Tiffany Fields did where they worked with premature infants and looking at the role that Touch played in improving the body weight gain of these premature infants. And body weight gain is a marker that's used in medicine to determine the progressive improvement of a state of health for that individual. Premature infants were a great study because here's a very, very controlled environment with these infants often struggling to survive where you know exactly how much nutrition they're receiving, you know exactly what that nutrition element is, you know what their sleep patterns are, you know, with their blood pressure, their heart rate, everything is being monitored. And the research that was done at the Touch Research Institute at Miami Medical School demonstrated that those premature infants who had an opportunity to be held more, to be touched, to be stimulated on their skin, that their body weight gains improved dramatically over those premature infants who had less touch. And that was significant to me. And when you look at Ashley Montague's book on touching and the role of child development with touching and stimulating the skin, it became clear to me that the role of the massage therapist in a human society and in an animal society in general, was significant as technology began to expand into every aspect of our lives. And uh, there was a book that was published in the 70s called Megatrends. And the author was forecasting and predicting what was coming in the future. And I remember reading about this concept of cell phones and mobile devices, oh, wow. and I thought that's pretty Star Trekish. ish uh, yet <laughs> you see where we are now. Yeah, right. but, but one of the comments the author made in Megatrends was that as technology began to grow and expand into every aspect of our lives, so would the need for touch, yeah. because that's the human connection. Now with the role of artificial intelligence, uh, when I visit people and they're sitting in their living room and I hear them shout out, Alexa, what's on TV? <laughs> oh, God. And then there's a response. I'm like, that's weird. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, so I just think massage therapists will be the connection for citizens to feel human, to remain human, 
and to still have the human experience. And to have the human experience, you must have touch. And I believe that we are living in a society where there are more humans, especially adults, who are living in a touch-deprived existence. And those individuals become clients of massage therapists, not because they have a rotator cuff injury, not because they have a pulled hamstring, not because they have a bad hip, but they simply need touch. And intuitively, they know this, but they may not be able to put it in words. So they just simply say, well, I'm going to get a massage today. I get a massage every week. It really helps me out. And they may not be able to explain to us how it helps me out. But what they know intuitively and what the human body and the human mind knows intuitively is that touch from other human beings is a necessity for the survival and the evolution of humankind. And with this advent of artificial intelligence and all this other uh, digital world, social media, uh, the massage therapist is going to be a major, major player yeah. in helping humans remain human. Oh, that's wonderful yeah, that you that say that. Yeah, really that's really amazing. True. Yeah, I, I've never thought about it like that, but that makes so much sense, actually. Um, and I can see how we're going to, you know, as people even don't know how to really relate to each other on a social level even, um, as we get more get more technologically savvy with everything, yeah, I can imagine that that's true. Like we're not going to be, you know, having much contact with each other. There's not much human touch involved anymore, right? Even like what we're doing now, like we're not really, <laughs> we're not really close to each other. So that we're really far away, actually. But um, I mean, the fact that we can do this is amazing. But yeah, I agree with you. I think there um, there is going to be a big need for that, and I don't think a lot of people realize how. Um, how healing touch can be and how how dysfunctional it can be if you don't have that in your life too so that's mm-hmm. a, that's a great point so the science talks about the tropic effect which is basically where the brain activity is stimulated by the sensory motors information to the brain and how often the brain will then send information to the muscles and the tissues for their growth and healing. And a lot of the new science now is coming into brain study and the neurology. And this seems to kind of be, they're catching up to what you already knew. (laughs) And But one of one of the things that I remember in your class was you talked about the where you came from and how you decided to do massage and what you did for massage therapists and how you got them into the Olympics and the importance of massage um, and with the athletes because the Europeans were already doing it. And I would like to let the listeners hear a part of that story, if you wouldn't mind, because it was so passionate and fulfilling to hear. Because as a massage therapist myself, working seven, eight hours, I mean, and plus on what you're saying is incredible for 42 years, because that means you have to have a lot of knowledge about yourself and how to take care of yourself, because that's a lot of energy you're giving out and working with. Sure, I'd be happy to share my journey on that piece with uh, massage therapy in the Olympics. And, And the reason that sharing that story with the Olympics, the Olympics is a great stage to showcase many things because so much of the world is paying attention and so much of the world is participating in the Olympics. So activities, events, statements, things that are showcased at the Olympics get a lot of traction in the world. So for many Olympics, massage therapy has always been a part of it with individual athletes, with particular teams, mostly from Europe. But in America, massage therapy was not given an equal place at the table with other recognized therapies. Physical therapy, medical doctors, chiropractors, nurses, massage therapists were seen as a luxury. It was seen as something that happens uh, in spas only. And 
when a massage therapist does massage really, really well, it looks very simple. So simple that many people believe that they can do it. Oh, right. Because on the surface, when you do it masterfully, it looks very simple. Mm -hmm. It's like when a race car driver drives really well, it looks simple, so simple that a person sitting in the stands thinks, oh, I can do that. Right. You press the gas pedal and you just go really fast. But so much is happening with that driver in that seat. The same is true for massage therapy. So much is happening with that massage, with that touch. But because it looks simple, many other professions in healthcare and medicine discounted massage as a profession because anyone can rub someone and that doesn't discount the effectiveness of it. But when it comes to working with athletes and certainly in an Olympic Games, uh, what I discovered is that it was more about political misunderstanding or not knowing the amazing enhancement for athletic performance that massage therapy can provide. And there were those in other professions that had this notion that massage therapists didn't have enough knowledge, whatever that is. And so uh, I felt that it was really important that massage therapists be included as an equal credentialed partner with other healthcare providers to provide needed care at an Olympic Games. And part of that comes from the fact that the two most requested services at the United States Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs is massage therapy and chiropractic. That makes sense. Mm. It just makes sense to me that if this is what athletes are asking for, if this is what athletes at a world-class level are requesting, there must be a positive reason for this. Yes. And, and the argument that I had frequently early in my career with athletic trainers and physical therapists and chiropractors, the argument that I had repeatedly was that, well, Benny, all it does is make you feel good. Wow. Makes you feel good. Imagine what you can do <laughs> right. if you feel good. <laughs> All but it this, does. <laughs> That's a big and, yeah, and this was the <laughs> argument that I got repeatedly, mostly from athletic trainers and physical therapists. Well, it just makes you feel good. Wow. Yeah, well, but isn't that imagine, everything, though? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's kind of what I think. <laughs> like, so imagine an yeah. athlete walking up to the line in track or getting up on the blocks and swimming are preparing to play beach volleyball, and they're feeling good. Mm. My guess is that their performance is likely to be better. Yes. And so what if all it does is make them feel good? So part of the reason that I think massage therapy was misunderstood is because the model of health care that's prevalent in the United States operates from a position of something has to be wrong in order to indicate service. So if you fracture a bone, sure, you need to see an orthopedic surgeon and have something done. If you are a post-operative patient and your muscles are now weak because you have atrophy because of disuse from the surgery, you have to see a professional to strengthen that again. So the model was that something always had to be wrong that we had to fix. Along comes massage, and a person can get a massage and not necessarily have a specific concern. Nothing's broken, nothing's painful, nothing is restricted, but I want a massage because when I have a massage, when I have that experience of touch, it allows me to be a fuller, more creative and better performing human being. And that's what happens before track and field events 
when we massage athletes with USA track and field, they feel better before they go out there. And they don't get on the massage table with anything wrong, so to speak. They just want to perform better. So, so that's what we do. So back to Atlanta. So in my position as a program manager for athlete medical services, my job in my department was tasked with deciding what do we provide at each of the sporting venues for some 10,000 athletes that will be visiting Atlanta from 123 countries. What would we provide for them? Well, we would have medical care, of course. Uh, we would have dental care. We had uh, optometrists uh, for eye care. We, we had everything that was necessary. And all of this was provided in the poly clinic in the Olympic Village. Every Olympic Village has a poly clinic. So you have everything there in the poly clinic, dental care, x-rays. Uh, you can get anything done there. And then at each venue, we would have uh, athletic trainers in particular because they work with athletic events all the time. You would have uh, an orthopedist available uh, as well. And the thing that would be the most requested was the massage therapy. Because why would I need to see an orthopedic surgeon before a 400-meter sprint when nothing's broken and nothing is wrong? But I would want to see a massage therapist before a 400-meter sprint because their massage would help me feel optimal to generate the necessary physical and mental power that will be necessary to endure the pain of sprinting 400 meters <laughs> under 43 seconds. There's a lot of pain involved. It's a good and point. The, yeah, and the only service that makes a difference for that athlete, both physically and mentally, simultaneously, is massage therapy. Yeah. So, with that in mind, going to the various medical meetings where we are deciding with the medical director what we're going to do. Uh, I just made it a point that we have to have massage therapy there and massage therapy has to be credentialed along with the athletic trainers, the medical doctors, the physical therapists, the chiropractors. They need to be a part of because they're probably going to be doing the majority of the heavy lifting period and they did. I always joke about people say, well, how did you like, <laughs> how did you get that passed? Well, <laughs> here's an example of where technology really made a difference. I simply got on my computer and when we were entering all the things that would be made available that we were sending to the IOC in Lausanne, Switzerland, I simply typed in licensed massage therapist, massage therapy services to be provided at XYZ venues and to be provided in the poly clinic and then pressed enter. <laughs> and a few seconds later, it appeared on someone's computer <laughs> at International Olympic Committee headquarters in Lausanne, Switzerland, and it was done. Wow. I mean, I laugh about it now <laughs> because... It, 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 it wasn't that complicated. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it was. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know if any of the people in Atlanta watching this podcast, well, sorry. <laughs> no, I just... I, <laughs> so, so nobody's complaining. Right. Uh, so, and, and the reason that I'm laughing in some of these medical meetings that I attended, it, it was clear to me that certain medical professions discriminate against other medical professions. Mm, yeah. And they discriminate based on the idea that we know more than you. Yes. Or you don't know enough. Yeah. Or you don't have X, Y, Z. And uh, all my life as an African American, uh, I have dealt with discrimination. So what program manager for Olympic athlete medical services 
was better suited to do this than <laughs> black man. Okay, I mean, let's just say it right? like it is. Yeah, because because I knew how to deal with the innuendos of discrimination. Yeah, yeah. Where where I'm sitting in a meeting at Georgia Tech with all these medical doctors and athletic trainers, and one of the orthopedic surgeons who will go unnamed at this time who was part of the sports medicine team, actually said in the meeting, well, if you're going to have chiropractors here, then I'm not going to be involved. Wow. And, <laughs> and, and, yes, and in my mind, I thought to myself, don't let the door hit you on the way out. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, that's, yeah. the, that's the sort of discrimination that I'm, I'm talking yeah, about I, in health care. And yeah. in medicine, it's discrimination against uh, other providers. And that discrimination occurs because those providers don't understand what we do. So right. it's on us to educate them about the efficacy of massage therapy, of touch in general, and the important role that it plays in a model that is only driven by something has to be broken in order for us to engage that person. Massage therapy is the one profession where you can see people when something is broken, so to speak, or when everything is working fine and we simply want to optimize that performance potential. We are the only profession that can operate on both sides of that model, which I think is pretty incredible and massage therapists should think about that more often. We are the only profession that can do that. We can mm -hmm. operate both sides of the fence. You cannot go see an orthopedic surgeon and not have anything wrong. I mean, could you, imagine going to, could you imagine going to an orthopedic surgeon's office on a clinic day and you sit down in the exam room and the orthopedic surgeon says, so what's wrong? Nothing. <laughs> Is broken? I just want to feel is good. Rotator, is your rotator cuff intact? Uh, is your hamstring torn? Is your ankle sprained or broken? Nope, 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 nope. Yeah. Okay? So, so they play an important role when that happens. But the majority of what people every day deal with are these minor musculotendinous fascial challenges that do not require medical attention, but they are situations that interfere with the performance potential of that active individual. So they can still go out and run, but they're maybe not running at their potential because the hamstring doesn't quite feel right. Yeah. Massage therapy can help that. Yeah. So that's how massage uh, ended up for the first time in Olympic history as an officially credentialed provider with all the other providers to give care to those athletes who warranted it. And from that point on, it's been uh, a big part of the services in the Olympic Village in every Olympics since then. It happened in 2000 in Sydney, uh, the uh, Australian Massage Association drove that boat in 2004 in Athens. George Kousalius, who ran the Core Institute in Tallahassee, Florida, a great massage therapy and bodywork training facility. He uh, was a co-director that headed up an international massage therapy team that provided thousands of massages in the Olympic Village in Athens. Uh, we had the same thing in Beijing in 2008 in the Olympic Village, again in 2012 in London. And these are all Olympic games that uh, I've been involved with. And so to see the evolution of those massage therapy services included as officially credentialed, I'd like to think that making that happen at the 96 Summer Olympics in Atlanta uh, helped in part to continue that acceptance by other medical professionals of the importance of massage therapy. Yeah. So there's I, abs 
Thank you. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I think it's I, very important. It's it's becoming more important, even widely more widely accepted. You can tell with um, a lot of the health insurance companies are actually covering uh, massage yeah. therapy now, which is amazing, and it's a great acknowledgement to that profession as a preventative healthcare method. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just simply love the story because the simple <laughs> moment of just typing something in changed the impact of what massage therapy meant yeah. for the whole United <laughs> States. Amazing. Like, you know, like we were behind <laughs> on knowledge and all of a sudden we caught up in like two se- two seconds of just those letters being typed on your computer. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, and, and, and it seems to kind of bring hope to my mind that, you know, the struggles that we go through when any kind of change seem to seem like there's so many steps to get to that one small change. But that is a signal of like, there's always a moment that you'll, you'll just instinctively remember the change yeah. happened. And, um, you know, massage therapists, um, you know, have such a wide range of influence, but I don't think um, we really get that knowing until you've gotten experience in, in that. And as we've seen, and I, I say it from my own experience, I've seen the change with all the spot envies and the things that are out there that kind of um, make it a little less impactful from my point of view, because I think it gets kind of droned out when there's only a, um, a, a no inspiration. So like one of the things that I really said again, I'll say again, is that you give inspiration based on the fact that your evolution from coming from the sixties where, and going into um, like when sp- when massage therapy was deemed a, a spiritual awakening of some sort or where, you know, people were just, you know, making everyone feel good um, to the science now that's catching up to this n- knowledge of why it's so important. Like if you really see that evolution is great. Like it is an in, in, incredible journey for that, um, that field. And so now I want to talk a little bit about how you are, creating that inspiration into continuing education courses that you are providing in uh, in your hometown um, of Fort Worth, Texas, and, um, and what is upcoming for you in terms of where you think massage therapy is going to continue to grow? See, I think massage therapy is a vehicle, and it's a vehicle that massage therapists can use to deliver hope to individuals, individuals who are challenged with pain, individuals who are uh, suffering from restricted movement, uh, individuals who are challenged with people not believing them about what they are experiencing. When you look at the current opioid epidemic that is so published now and you hear about on newscasts you read about in newspapers and magazines this situation of how many americans have been managing and treating pain with medications that are addictive and destructive over time and looking at this has given me inspiration that massage therapists can play a big role in this whole deal. Pain is a big part of what many people suffer from on a daily basis. And touch as a vehicle to give people hope that change can be achieved is a powerful, powerful medicine. So massage therapy is a vehicle to deliver hope. And when people have hope, people get better. Mm -hmm. People respond to various therapeutic interventions if they have hope. And the opposite of hope is despair. And despair is not a place that any human being wants to be. It's an unpleasant place to be. So if you can give someone hope, you give them an opportunity to get better. And massage therapists are in the best position to do that because of the closeness that our work entails. 
It's one-on-one. It's just you and that client in that space together, working together to achieve a balance that that person is seeking, and you as a massage therapist are helping to guide them. With this opioid epidemic that's happening in the country now, I just think massage therapists are in a great position to make this change. What I teach and try to impart to massage therapists is that it's not about technique. It's about strategy. What's the strategy of your massage session? What's the strategy that will make a difference for that person? And in the end, giving them hope allows their body's immune system and all the physiology that's there to work optimally. And part of that begins with the massage therapist simply believing the client. So if the client tells you, my back hurts, my knee hurts, my foot hurts, my neck hurts, and you believe them. So many people are just simply not believed in the medical profession. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because they operate from a fix-it model. Mm -hmm. And here's typically what I will see in my clinic. Well, Benny, I've seen an orthopedist. I've been in physical therapy for three months. MRIs are negative. X-rays are negative. Bone scans negative. They can't find anything wrong. But I still hurt. And so what happens is that they get put into a system of doing physical therapy. And at the end of it, not all cases, but many cases, the person says, well, I still feel the same. I still hurt. And because there isn't any definitive diagnostic material to support that, then the patient is simply told, well, it's all in your head. As if somehow your head is not part of who you are or part of your body. And I hear this all the time. Well, it's just in your head. Well, that's part of me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. 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 What does that even mean, right? Yeah. I know. I just... And, and that was the argument I used to get all the time, second only to, well, Benny just makes them feel good. And then the second was that, well, it's just in their head. <laughs> well, it's not doing them any right. harm, so what? Right. So, so what I try to do is inspire massage therapists to understand that their massage therapy is a vehicle to deliver hope, to give people hope. And it is a way to deliver care and compassion. And care and compassion for the massage therapist simply means when you ask that client questions about where do you feel pain, where do you feel tightness, where do you feel soreness, you know, what brought you here today, and then to simply believe them. The act of believing another person when they tell you, I have pain, sure, my MRI is negative, whatever that means, sure, the x-ray is negative, whatever that means. Sure, the nerve conduction test is negative, whatever that means. I don't know what any of that stuff means when a person tells me, well, but I still hurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then comes the opioid prescription. And this is this is (laughs) we this is how we got into this mess. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I agree. Because well, that medical professional is just not trained to deal with it. Yeah. Right. And that's what and, they're trained to do is to give pharmaceuticals. Yes. And that's, I mean, that's what they're, you know, that's their training. Yes. Yeah. Because if nothing is clearly broken, well, what else is there left for me to do? Well, I can write you a script. What I would say to all the medical professionals who might be within the sound of my voice right now, it's not like one of those 1950s radio <laughs> people, you are within the good... sound of my voice, here's what you should do. Get a massage therapist involved with your medical practice. All you have to do is go back and look at Hippocrates, who created an oath that all of the medical professionals aspire to. Above all else, do no harm. But read what Hippocrates did. They massaged people. 
they used essential oils. Right. They talked to people about nutrition. Imagine that. Wow. I know, right? Go figure. People, <laughs> what you're eating might have something to do with why you are experiencing what you're experiencing. Yes. Get a massage therapist as part of your care team. Yes. To deliver hope to these patients and to have a sense of belief. Believe what your people tell you and they will help guide you as a team to a solution that will help people. And I just think that in my classes, I just tell massage therapists is not about technique. It's about strength. Yes, mm. and I think a team is great. I mean, I'm a, I'm a personal trainer, and I feel like the mas- my massage therapist is uh, my partner. He helps me. Yes, he helps me with my clients. You know, he we we work together. So, you know, I think it's essential too. That's very essential to have oh, yeah. that person in your in your group for sure. Um, and yeah. you know, it sounds like you're you're helping people take a layer of stress off, and that. That uh, brings the hope to the surface because you can get into a negative uh, kind of feedback loop with, uh, you know, because you, like you said, like people are telling you there's nothing wrong, but you know there's something wrong, and that's right. depressing. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, and what happens? Yeah, and what happens is we we try to intellectualize it away. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh, you know, uh, there's nothing here on this X-ray, so it's just all in your head. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, you know. Yeah, like you said, it is in your head, but it still hurts. Yeah, and maybe you know the the other thing to think about is maybe all the all the options and and all the uh, solutions have not been uh, actualized yet. You know, there there might we might not know yet. Like that's the mystery yes. of it, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, and and that's the curiosity that takes me to work every day. That's exactly awesome. what you yeah. just said there. And and let me just add, so the facility that. I'm in, uh, I help to design with the architect. So we have, we're in a 10,000 square foot building that's completely copper clad. So the oh, wow. entire building is clad in copper because copper has some sort of healing power that I don't quite understand. And I think it has to do with some grounding aspects. So yeah, it makes yeah, it's it a, some kind of electromagnetic thing going on there, right? Yeah. It's like very I know pulling the, you down, yeah. kind of. Yeah. And, and it's antimicrobial. <laughs> the, Romans, the Romans used <laughs> copper. The Egyptians used copper. So we thought it'd be pretty cool to clad the entire building in copper. Oh, so, wow. so first of all, the building is clad in copper. <laughs> so you walk into our lobby. And there's these uh, 30-foot polished copper walls, so it's kind of striking. Uh, on the ground floor, we have a 4,500-square-foot weight room strength training complex. And then next to that, we have a uh, Ph.D. sports psychologist uh, who works with people. And then you go upstairs to my athletic therapy center. So upstairs, I have a 5,000-square-foot design for massage therapy facility. So we have an athletic training room. We have nine private massage therapy uh, suites. All the suites are 12 by 12, 144 square feet. They all have 30-foot ceilings. They all have windows for natural light. They all have a modernized shoji screen sliding door. So we can utilize all the space in the room. All the rooms are equipped with the electric high-low table so that I can protect the massage therapist. They can use good body mechanics and so forth. And then the hallways to the therapy suites are 50 feet uh, at the pitch, all with skylights. So we have natural lighting everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then there's a full-size laundry room uh, with Uh, two high-capacity washers, two high-capacity dryers, where the massage therapist, we control uh, our own uh, laundry in terms of cleaning and sanitizing and so forth, uh, complete with folding tables. And also, massage therapists don't have to take laundry home if they uh, work in my facility. And, And the reason that I went through great lengths with natural lighting, spacious environment, is that I operate on a model that 
therapy begins with the first contact the massage therapist has with the client. And that typically begins with the phone call. So the words that you use on the phone when you are scheduling that appointment. So so here's the thing in, in my facility. I do not have a receptionist. That is by design because I want every massage therapist, including myself, to schedule that appointment directly with that client and to start that contact verbally with that client. Because as soon as you make contact on the phone with that client, the massage therapy session has begun. Mm. It's already begun. Mm -hmm. The words you use, what you say to them, what you educate them about, and every conversation that I have on the phone when I schedule a person, every phone conversation ends with, I can help you. I say that at the end of every call, every email correspondence, I finish with, I can help you. Now, I didn't say, I will make you see again. I didn't <laughs> say, I'll make you fly. I didn't say, I'll make your disease go away. I simply said, I can help you. And we as massage therapists and we as human beings can help people in many, many ways, most of them unseen. So MRI is never going to see it. X-ray is never going to see it. Bone scan is never going to see it. Never going to see how you help that person. Mm -hmm. So I always say to my clients, I can help you. The therapy has begun. So now... When they pull up into your parking lot, the therapy has begun. When they come through your front door, the therapy has begun. Long before they ever get on your massage table, you are already working with that person. So choose your words, choose your phrases. Uh, all of these things make a difference. And then massage, touch is the vehicle to deliver this hope. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, ground it in science, anatomy, physiology, and it is a dynamic therapeutic experience for individuals. And this is why I stay booked solid five and six months in advance. Besides therapists say, well, how do you keep so many people going? You give them a great experience of care and compassion and you give them hope and you drive it with massage, you drive it with touch, they will continue to come to you for that because it helps them to feel human in a digital world yes. that artificial intelligence is becoming the standard. So that's my story. Gosh, that was yeah. amazing! Thank you. Um, yeah, that was, it's all good. Well, Benny, can that you, was perfect. Yeah, it really was. That oh my gosh, that was I learned so much today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us? Can you tell our audience where they can find you and the best way to contact you and, and if they want to work with you or find out more about uh, what you yeah. offer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm kind of a, a peculiar teacher on that. So, so only recently. Uh, have I made it easier to find me? Many years, I didn't have a website, and that right. was an intention. But with pressure from uh, some of the millennials who work with me, who are massage therapists, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah. uh, wife, uh, who has a PhD in <laughs> exercise physiology, uh, who is you know pretty modern and knows technology, uh, I finally... I've reached the point where I have a website now uh, where people can reach me and email me. See, see, before, my whole deal was besides therapists who wanted to find me, who really wanted to find me, they would find me. Yeah. Yeah. So, That's amazing. So it, was, so it was my own vetting process. But now, you know, yeah. uh, I'm 66 years old. I've got to, like, get with the program. So I have a website. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, you don't just have one. You have two, and I'll repeat yeah. them. One of them is www.bennyvontherapy.com, where you can reach and see the beautiful pictures of the um, facility that he spoke of. And the second one is www.bennyvonworkshops.com, and it's got his schedule and how you can find him and do take one of his workshops locally in Fort Worth. I'm not sure if you have your traveling schedule on there, if you're doing any more traveling out to... Yes, um, yeah. Yes, the the uh, it will show traveling. I, I'll be in Gainesville, Florida, uh, in a couple of weeks at the Florida School of Massage. That will be on there. But it but it will show other sites. I'll be in Maine next mm. year okay. at the Down East School of Massage. So what what's happening is I had a self imposed sabbatical from teaching for a decade, and I focused on just all of my clinical work. And, and the reason I did that, uh, I feel like if you are going to master something, you have to do it a lot. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And, uh, and so I wanted to really concentrate on really mastering massage therapy because I felt that my ability to teach other massage therapists would be enhanced because... I'm a for real massage therapist doing massage therapy every day. <laughs> right. Like, well, yeah. well, you did yeah. influence a great teacher also, Whitney Lowe's um, oh, book, yes. uh, the uh, orthopedic yeah. assessment book. All that, I, 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 if I say this correctly, I hope, is that it is all your kind of your collection of work that uh, Whitney kind of combined and worked and made his own. Um, but that is being taught in certain schools of massage. Okay. So you have influenced, whether or not you've been on the lecture tour or been on the uh, around the world, people have been studying this book and changing massage therapy in such a different way because it's helping um, distinguish clinical work and helping um, people understand what the assessments are doing to help even help the massage therapists help work with other fields. So um, influence-wise, you've done a great service to the world of uh, massage therapy and the world in general. So we definitely appreciate that book. Yeah, well, and, and, and let me just say, uh, thank you for reminding me of that. There's a lot of people in massage therapy education over time that started out as students of mine, which I find interesting. So uh, here's some factoids. So Paul St. John of Paul St. John Neuromuscular Therapy fame was a massage student of mine. George Kusalius, who started the Core Institute, was a massage student of mine. Uh, Whitney Lowe, uh, who, of course, uh, the Orthopedic Massage Education and Research Institute. Um, Scott Lamp who wrote the book with Patricia Benjamin on sports massage, was a student of mine. Uh, all of these folks studied in the classroom with me to become massage therapists. And uh, I hope that I inspired them enough, and apparently I did for many, to go on and, uh, and expand that tree. And, and that was always one of the things that I felt like I could contribute because Whitney Lowe is a better writer than I am. Mm. And so my job was to inspire him to, uh, because I recognize his talent straight away. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, we're very th thankful for that book. It's very, very yeah, um, amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. He, he started out uh, taking my sports massage workshops in Atlanta. And it was clear to me when he took the course for a second time that he was serious. <laughs> so so, so I, I invited him to come down to Gainesville, Florida, uh, and spend some time with me uh, at the athletic department. And, and then I encouraged him to get a job with uh, the Emory Sports Medicine Orthopedic Center. Uh, yeah, so it, it's all good. So yeah, I'm, tr I'm trying to inspire the profession. And, and, and here's the key. If we add science to what we do, it will enhance your intuition. Mm. So, this, oh, yeah. so this idea that 
intuitive massage or intuition is some random series of events. No, intuition is a vehicle for having hard scientific knowledge. Yeah, so yeah. what you have to do is fill yourself with hard scientific knowledge and the more anatomy knowledge, physiology knowledge, fascial anatomy knowledge, uh, anatomy of the joints, of movement, the more you fill your plate with that information, you will see your therapeutic intuition grow and expand. And this is a very difficult concept to, to teach because I'm often asked, I'll have massage therapists come and they want to observe me work or something because they're expecting to see some sort of magical technique mm. or this and that. Yeah. It's touching the skin, folks. Okay, <laughs> yeah. it's not rocket science. <laughs> but, but what is rocket science is knowing anatomy, is knowing biomechanics, right. is knowing the physiology of the hormone system in the body, knowing the physiology of the lymphatic system. The more of that you have, the better your therapeutic intuition gets. So when I'm working, it's hard for me to explain to people. People say, well, well, how do you decide what you're going to do next? And, and I really have to tell you, I do it on the fly with therapeutic intuition. But my therapeutic intuition is very keen because I have a really keen storehouse of hard science knowledge. Right. Yeah. And if you do that, your therapeutic intuition will guide every step of that massage therapy with that client and you will get results that you never dreamt you could get with massage. So that's my piece on therapeutic. In wow. Therapeutic intuition is not some random event. When I hear massage wow. therapists say, well, I just kind of work intuitively. I just kind of know. <laughs> yeah. You can study that anatomy book. Read the work from the Fascial Congress. Read the research that's being done by the Massage Therapy Foundation. And then you will see your therapeutic intuition really expand and become powerful. Absolutely. It's something, remember, we touched upon this on our last podcast with Zachariah, and he was talking about a similar thing. And, um, you know, it's, it's not, it, it's like you learn all these things, but you don't particularly remember every detail, but the intuition comes in when you, when you, it, it comes up for you when you need it. Right. Um, yes. so that's kind of how it works. And, and I, I love how you put that. That was, that was wonderfully expressed. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, just to say, you know, thank you again. I'm really appreciative that I even got to meet you in person. Thank you for being on our show. Um, the thank humbleness you. that yes. you carry, the, the, the self care that you care for yourself and others, it immensely radiates from you. And I'm truly grateful for it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank well, you so thank much you. for coming on our show. This was really yeah. wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. this is awesome. I, I love it. And, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing at myself that I'm actually using technology. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> <Look here. laughs> okay. Right? It's, it, change is good. Yes. Yeah. You know? yeah. I'll, I'll end with one short story about change okay. is good. So for, for decades in my massage therapy practice, I only accepted cash or checks. That's all I took. And most of it, you know, people would, pay cash. So the reputation was, well, if you go see this massage therapist, you better bring some cash because he doesn't take credit cards or this and that. I just wasn't involved in that technology. So now uh, I moved to this new facility. It's all good. Uh, my wife gets me set up on the square. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> and, and she buys me a tablet and you just put the credit card in there and you just do this and and it goes like straight to your bank account. Yeah. So, yeah. so the first few longtime clients of mine come in to the new facility, <laughs> and so they're getting ready to check out. And uh, I said, you know, I can take credit cards now. And the first five of them 
actually sat down on a chair in the reception room <laughs> and said, oh, wait, wait, hold, 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 hold up just a minute. Let me sit down. Like, what? Like, what's going You're on? Credit card. Right. <laughs> said, welcome to the 21st uh... century. Uh, so anyway. That's great. Uh, I'm, I'm there with you all now. And uh, thank you for oh. uh, letting me <laughs> be a part of this technology uh, to yeah. share with the rest of the profession and the rest of the world. So thank you both for the opportunity. Uh, I've enjoyed thank you. it. Thank you. For, <laughs> yeah, we have too. And, and thank you for doing what you do. Okay. And, yeah. and ju maybe on a, a little side note, you can progress to a webinar and then you can oh. reach people. <laughs> That would be crazy. <laughs> I don't want to over, overload your, or if your fuses might change yeah. or something, but there yeah. might be something else out there that can help okay. you get reach people. But yeah. once well, again, I, I thank you. Two of you. I appreciate uh, the two of you kind of slowly bringing me in. <laughs> Easy. Well, thank you, Benny. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you so much. It. Okay. Right. Have a good night. Take okay, care. thanks.